Walking with Jesus through the Gospels, and we are in the tail end of the Sanhedrin trial. We're getting ready to go to see Pilate. So we're going to be in the three synoptic Gospels and somewhat in John as well. So I'm going to be putting them on the board so that you can keep track with it. And uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of a lot more moving between the Gospels tonight than what we are accustomed to. Yeah, if, have you, have need, if you need bookmarks, then <laughs> yeah. We have piles of these. Because they're all kinds. I always find it easy to just flip my page looped to the next section where I'm going to be for those four sections. That's helpful for you. If not, then you have, we have bookmarks available for your use. Okay, so we are coming to Matthew 27. Looking here at verses 1 and 2, Mark is the parallel, Mark 15, and it also, it is just verse 1, Luke 22, 66 to 71. So we'll start there at Luke, okay? Sixty-six to seventy-one. Can we start here? When the day when day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, I tell you, you will not believe. If I tell you, sorry, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. When they came, they reconvened. They, they're going over this information one more time. Coming back to Matthew 27, we see the same thing, but it's in much more condensed form. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And the same thing with Mark 15 and verse 1, speaking very similarly to what how Matthew uh, speaks it to us. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And then they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. Okay. Notice that they are doing this as soon as it was morning. Why? Think in light of what was taking place through the nighttime hours. Why are they doing this now when they've already, Luke sort of condenses it. And so it's, it's difficult to say whether Luke is condensing it because then they're saying, what, is, what do you have to say regarding this? And it sounds very similar to what he's already spoken to the high priest, or it could be that they're speaking it to him again. But if he's condensing it, we need to realize that it is morning and we know that at the very least, this has taken place earlier on or later last night, like through the wee hours of the morning. So why are they doing this again when it comes morning at daybreak? It wasn't supposed to happen at night. No trial at night, no verdict at night. But they can't change the fact that they've held a hearing at nighttime, but they can try to expedite things or at least cover their tracks in a sense to try to backpedal and at very least try to cover this base and have a ruling at daybreak. But what's the problem with that? The verdict has to be how far away from the trial, 24 hours from the trial. So they're nowhere near that. 
but they're still. When, when deception and lies are at work, there's no logic to it, right? So they can't, they can't reason this out because it's all according to deception and lies. They're looking to frame him. They're looking for any way whatsoever in order to put him to death. When we come back to Luke, um, yeah, that's another aspect. I think I'll leave that for now. But we saw that they were scheming to figure out a way to put him to death. That was their intention going into this trial, into this hearing. So now they've already passed the verdict. They're passing it again now that it's daybreak. And with this daybreak deliberation, what is it that they've determined that they're going to do now? Matthew and Mark tells us what they end up doing. So Matthew says the, they took counsel against Jesus to put him to death, and then they took him to Pilate, bound, and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Okay. Would this be public? No. This is taking place at Caiaphas's home. It's as public, it's, it's, it's only public in as much as those that are in that outer court and whatever they might be able to overhear. But it's not a public hearing because the the hearings were designed to be taking place at the temple precincts where there was uh, the location where the Sanhedrin met for such matters. But this wasn't designed to be a public hearing. This was a Sanhedrin. The council is meeting together to, to determine how they're going to put him to death. Let's continue on in Matthew. All right, so they are taking him to Pilate. But in the meantime, we've got Matthew 27, verses 3 to 10. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. How far down do you want me to go? Down to 10. They said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for a potter's field as the Lord directed. So Judas learns, so he's on the outside in the outer courts, or he's outside of the outer court itself and becomes aware of it somehow that Jesus is condemned. And so what does he do? In the midst of all the commotion that's going on, he, he's not able to do this in secret, obviously, because the, the chief priests and, and the elders, they're busy themselves with the matter of expediting Jesus to Pilate. So what, are they, what does he do? He comes up and says, you take it back. This is innocent blood. And they take it, and now they, they convene amongst themselves for a moment. Now they, now they have to uh, go in, in a secluded area because they don't want people to know that they've bribed Judas. And so they scheme some more. Isn't it interesting? What do they determine to do with the money, and why do they determine to do it that way? I'll get you to just to speak a little bit louder on that, please. They used the money to buy a, a potter's field for a burial place for the Romans. All right, because? Well, it was blood money. It was blood money. So it's not, they said it's not lawful, 
lawful to put it back into the treasury. So they care about law. They care about law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they don't care about law. They care about it and yet they don't. Yeah. As long as it meets their criteria, their preference, then they're good to go with what's lawful. But if it doesn't suit them, they will, they broke 22 of their own regulations in the past few hours. I was like, aren't they? I was going to say, this is the days of Jesus. Until the days of Jesus. Something right? Sure. Yeah. So Judas, at that point, realized what he'd done, but did he not know or think what was going to happen? Well, in advance of this, you mean? Well, yeah, by the very fact that he betrayed Jesus. Mm -hmm. He was doing, he knew it was wrong. Yeah. Being done in secret. I, I just wonder what he thought was actually going to happen. As a result of all this. Well, it uh, can only be speculation, but what I've read over the years, and um, I, I would agree with it, it appears as though he was impatient for what Jesus was looking to do in bringing about the kingdom. I mean, they've been following this Messiah for three and a half years now, or three years, because his ministry has been gone going for three and a half, but the disciples didn't come into it right at the very beginning, the, the first day. So some of them within the first, well, there has to be 40 days that pass first of all, right? Yes. Because he's in the wilderness. Uh, so already you're a month and a bit into his ministry. Then he starts collecting some of his, amassing some of his disciples, but they didn't all follow him at the very beginning. So let's say three, uh, maybe three years in, a, in a, a month or two, two, three months that they've been following him. And he's being referred to as, by many, the son of Good. Both of those are right, but more often than not, most people didn't call him son of man. More often than not, it was he who called himself son of man. So more people, they would be referring to him. Surely this is the son of Joseph. David. Oh, David. Sorry. David. Yeah, not a <laughs> Nothing to be sorry about. No, they're all right. <laughs> so they're all correct. So those are things that he is, but what they would refer to him as would be the son of David, which is a reference to him being the Messiah. Messiah. And Messiah means anointed, anointed, which is in reference more, most uh, prominently as the king. So that being the case, what are his disciples expecting? And we know that they're expecting this even for what's going to take place after his resurrection and, that, and shortly before Jesus ascends to heaven during those 40 days, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, I think it is, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What do they have in their minds? Are you, you going to establish your kingdom? Are you going to, you are the Messiah after all. I mean, there, there's no greater criteria now. I mean, you've demonstrated your power. You're resurrected. I mean, now let's, you know, are you now going to do this? But he has something that needs to be taken care of before his kingdom is established. You mentioned? They wanted to get rid of Rome. They wanted to get rid of Rome, yeah. So what is Judas doing? He's trying to force Jesus' hand that perhaps by doing this, we, he knows he has the power. He knows he has the authority. He's witnessed it himself. And so he is perhaps thinking by doing this, he'll have no, no other option but to, you know, cut fish or cut bait, right? So if not, he's going to go home. So I, it's going to show his true colors. If he's intending to be Messiah, then be Messiah already. I mean, let's, let's get it done. More than that, though, we see that when he had decided to do this and he meets with the, uh, with the chief priests, what do we hear, what do we learn about something supernatural happening? Satan enters him at that point. So there's, there's something very um, wicked taking place in the, in the process here. Now, some of your trans, trans, uh, translations 
Look at verse three. What does it say? When, when he saw that Jesus was condemned, what did he do? He changed his mind. Any other translations? What he words? Was seized with remorse. Seized with remorse. Remorseful. Remorseful. Anybody have the King James or the New King James? I have the King James. Remorseful. Remorseful. So the King James says he repented himself. That almost sounds like, well, if he repented, he's good, right? Um, what he says in there also is that I have sinned by mm -hmm. praying innocent blood. Yeah. He recognizes his sin. In a sense. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I will address that in a second. See, what does, that, what does that mean and how does it impact or affect him? He says, so this is Matthew 27 and verse 3. Are you there in King James? Please. Um, then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver. So many people who favor the King James or are aware of the King James would say it's more than just a change of mind. Obviously, he repented. And if he repented, obviously, he is saved, forgiven, saved. But this isn't the word that is used for a repentance of, uh, you said you're looking at the Greek. What does the Greek word say there? Um, to be concerned, to regret, um, changing one's mind or purpose after having done something regrettable. It's contrasted with to repent. So it's, it's not repenting. I've done a lot of things in my life that I regret. Yeah. It doesn't mean that. That's right. So a lot of people have regret or remorse, but it doesn't mean that they've repented. They're, they're, they're regretting the outcome and the consequences now. And so when you look at the King James, uh, he repented. It would be in the sense of a king uh, of English from 500 years ago, speaking about a, a change of mind. But it's not a godly change of mind. This is not a godly sorrow but this is a worldly sorrow. So godly sorrow leads to repentance. But godly sorrow, or excuse me, worldly sorrow leads only to death, regret. It, says, um, it means nothing more than a selfish dread of the consequences of what one has done. Mm. Yeah. So I wanted to address that for clarification because some of you, and none of, none of us had the King James tonight, but some of our viewers may end up having the King James or at least be aware of the fact that, didn't I, haven't I heard at some point where Jesus, Judas repented? But he didn't repent in this true sense of the word. The Greek word that is used here is not the word that is used to indicate or to speak of true repentance unto God. So when it says, I have sinned, it's, that means I've done wrong. But it doesn't mean, just because somebody recognizes they've done wrong, doesn't mean that they're taking responsibility for the wrong that they've done uh, in this, to, to confess it to the Lord and say, God, here I am. I'm a sinner and uh, I have done wrong. I have sinned, you know, like David did or um, any number of other uh, saints who repented of the sins that they were guilty of. So he's simply just proclaiming it. I guess the other thing that comes to my mind too is that if he had truly repented, I doubt that he would have hung himself. Mm. Right? I mean, bring, salvation brings new hope. You know? Salvation brings new hope, uh, but there can be points where, where there are b believers who have just in such despair over for whatever reason, because of circumstances or uh, mental illness or depression, whatever the case might be, and they may end up deciding to take their life. Does that mean that they are not in the kingdom of heaven? That's a good question. Good question. Yeah. Not necessarily. Is that what I heard here? Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't want to care to expound? Or any sin, for that matter, sin, right? Yeah. So let me ask you this. Is suicide the unpardonable sin? No. I wouldn't say it is. 
So let me put it in a different perspective then, now looking at that. We can't say, we can say that it's not because there's only one unpardonable sin and that's in Matthew 13 and, or Matthew 12, and that's in reference to the religious leaders of Israel in Jesus' day and it could only be committed in that time frame. After Jesus ascended and went back to heaven, the unpardonable sin could not be committed. So it's not possible to commit the unpardonable sin. And that's in a much earlier study that we did when we were looking at Matthew chapter 12 at the time. So we don't have time to go into that tonight. So if you wanna search it out or you wanna discuss later on after we're done, I'd be happy to do so. But just so that we know that it, we have addressed it. So it's not the unpardonable sin. Secondly, if, if you or I say we lied or had lust or we cheated or we had a, a bad attitude, like we, we sinned in our anger and we died before we had a chance to confess or repent of that sin, are we going to be in heaven if we are followers of Jesus Christ? So everybody said yes to that. But if I said, if somebody who's a believer commits suicide because of whatever overwhelming, whatever they're experiencing, is that the sin that's gonna keep them out of heaven? Sin is sin, is sin, is sin, is sin. So what sin did Jesus not cover when he went to the cross? Now, are we saying go ahead and commit suicide? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're saying don't sin, right? Paul says in Ephesians, or excuse me, Romans 5, verse 21, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Then in chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, then what shall we say? Should we, should we sin so that grace should abound even more? He, he doesn't just say no. He says, God forbid. Definitely not. So this is not saying, you know, feel free to sin. It's saying... Every sin is paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. Past, present, and future. There's no double jeopardy here. We were in jeopardy of our sins before we came to Christ, but he paid for our sins. We accepted his payment, so there's no double jeopardy. It's been paid. What is it? Anybody know what that means, double jeopardy? I mean, I'm not talking about Alex Trebek here, okay? No, no, what does double jeopardy mean? Uh, isn't that... Tried for the same crime twice. Yeah. So somebody who's been tried for a crime, found guilty, and have been sentenced and done their time, whatever the amount of time is, then once that time has been served, they cannot be tried for the crime, that same crime, and be sentenced to do that again because the price has been paid in full. If there was, so that would be referred, if somebody was tried, that's called double, double jeopardy, and it's not acceptable under the law. It's the same thing with our sins. We are, we are not in double jeopardy. Our sins have been paid already in full, okay? So this is Judas. And so it's, it's, it's so paradoxical that the, the chief priests they're concerned about what's lawful and not lawful in this matter. And so what do they do? They buy a field and uh, for the purpose of burying strangers. And that ends up becoming the place where Judas is buried. Now, in verse 8 onwards, we read that this was the fulfillment of prophecy. That's interesting, isn't it? Even their actions is a fulfillment of prophecy. So it speaks about what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. So uh, Matthew is lumping Jeremiah and Zechariah together here because there's two aspects that we're gonna be looking at of what both of these prophets address. So let's look at Zechariah first. So Zechariah chapter 11.
chapter 11. So uh, second, if you go to Matthew, go back two books. Malachi is just before Matthew. Zechariah is just before Malachi. So we're at Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13. Uh, we're a taught, I believe. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weigh out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the, the Lord, lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord, to the potter. So interesting that in, in connection with this, the 30 pieces of silver is connected as a messianic prophecy that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, which was the amount of a slave. And now with this, there would be the taking of that money. You look at it to begin with, how's that going to be to the potter? But we see how it ends up playing out. Then I want us to go to Jeremiah, because there's some things that Jeremiah addresses in connection with this. And this is one of the reasons that Matthew uh, refers to it as the prophet Jeremiah. So he's linking them two together. So there's a few passages we're going to look at in Jeremiah, chapter 18 to begin with. And we're looking at verses 2 and 3. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. All right, so Jeremiah is dealing with some things regarding the potter. Let's go fast forward now to 32. Still, all of these few are in Jeremiah, all right? 32, verses 8 and 9. And just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, By my field at Han Hanoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it, since it is your right to redeem it and possess it by it yourself, I knew that this was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field at Hanoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver. So this is a, a plot of land that Jeremiah was told to purchase and that he would then, uh, it seemed to be a worthless piece of land because they're about to go into captivity, but it would be redeemed at the end of the captivity. So he buries that uh, deed. So the element of a field coming on here with the potter. Let's go back now to chapter 7. We're going to. Still Jeremiah, yes. And there's one more passage in Jeremiah. 31 to 34. Yes, they have built the high places of Topheth, 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 uh, in the valley of Ben Hanan, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire. Everything I did, everything I did not command, nor did I enter, or nor did it enter my mind. So beware. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when people no, will no longer call it Tophen or the Valley of ben Hebron, Hinnom. Hinnom, Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter, for they will bury the dead in Tophen until there is no more room. Uh, we're going down to 34. Okay. Then the carcasses of the, these, the, 
This people will become food for the birds of the air, the beasts of the earth, and they will be no longer to frighten them away. I will bring an end to the sounds of joy and gladness and to the voices of bride and bridegroom in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for this land will become desolate. What are some places that you see mentioned there? All right, Topheth and Ben Hinnom, not names that uh, come easy to us because they're not common names. Uh, we've got Topheth. Ben Hinnom. What is Ben Hinnom? So Ben is the son, son of Enom. Now, it became the name of a valley, so it would be called the Valley of Enom. All right, so we can have Valley of Enom, Ben Enom. Let's see if this sounds familiar. So valley in, the, in Hebrew is gay. G-E-Y. Jesus speaks about this place. He references it on occasion. In the Greek, it takes on a different, little bit different sound, but Gehinom becomes in Greek Gehenna. Gehenna. What does Gehenna represent? Hell. So the valley of Hinom, the Ben Hinom, is a representation of Hell. See, what would be taking place is that these high places of Topheth, it's where that they were uh, sacrificing their children to these other deities, false deities, like Molech and Kemesh, where they would be sacrificing their children. And, and some of these gods, these statues would be formed in such a way so that their arms would be outstretched like this together. And then the, at the base of the arms would be a wide gaping mouth and inside would be hollow. This is a massive statue, all right? Inside would be a furnace. So they would place their children on the arms of that God and then they would give a push and then the child would then roll into the open mouth, the flaming furnace of these false gods. So I can see as you're, as I'm speaking this around this room that there is just, I, how can this be? Just flabbergasted that that's going on. Our culture is no different. Our culture is the same, except we don't have a furnace right. immediately that they're being put into. They Although they're being put into incinerators <laughs> afterwards, after the fact. But there are thousands, tens of thousands of our children being sacrificed to the God of convenience and immorality and perversion by means of abortion. Nevertheless, this is what was going on on Topheth. And the Valley of Hinnom became a place where bodies were thrown and garbage was was thrown and it became the the garbage dump if you will and it was a it was a continual burning and so that became a, a picture then of hell that's why Gehen, or Gehenna is this picture that Jesus where the where the the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched so this is that picture okay so do you see what Jeremiah is speaking here. This is a prophecy. He says that the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of Hinnom. So sounds counterintuitive of a high place being in a low place. A high place being in a valley. But a high place simply means a place that is elevated in someone's mind or estimation. Okay. Now let's have a look at the screen. So if you have a look at the screen... 
I'm going to orient you, okay? Remember we looked at Caiaphas' place and the Temple Mount in the model of the city of Jerusalem. Let me help you now. The Temple Mount is in almost the center of the, the screen. So this is where the temple stood, just to the left and almost on the end of the Y of Valley is Caiaphas' place. So right in this area. So what trails off from the other side of the city wall is the Hinnom Valley, Gehinnom or Gehenna, which comes around to the southern point of the city to meet the Kidron Valley. All right, so that green and the yellow or orangish uh, are, are the two valleys, the Valley of Hinnom, the orange and uh, green is the Kidron Valley. Remember, the Kidron Valley is what separated the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives, right? So at the where they meet is the place that they bought, which is referred to as the Field of Blood. So this is the plot of ground that they bought. Interestingly, they said that days are coming, then when it will no more be called Topheth or the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. Well, here... Judas, what is his name in Hebrew? Anyone know? Judas is the Greek sound of it. Judah. So Judah is the Hebrew in the English. So his name is Judah. So no problem calling our kids. You may know some kids or, or people that are called Judah. But you don't probably know anyone who's called Judas. <laughs> but it's the same name. Furthermore... Uh, the second last book of the Bible is called Jude. Jude, which is another version of the name Judah. Judah. With this, Judas was the first to be buried in this field. And it became representative of this valley now, the Valley of Hinnom. Gehenom, Gehenom. As we look at this last passage... I'm going to draw our attention back to this in just a moment. But in chapter 19 and verse 11. Let's look at 10 and 11. I think we're back to, yeah, over here. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you and shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, so will I break this people and the city as one breaks a potter's vessel so that it can never be mended. Men shall bury in Topheth because they will be no place else to bury. So where are they going to bury? And where is Topheth? In the Valley of Hinnom, which is represented now by token from the time of Judas onwards as the field of blood. What did Jesus say was going to happen when the armies surround the city? What's going to happen? They're going to destroy the city. He tells his disciples, when you see the city surrounded by armies, what are you to do? Flee, run to the mountains. Because those that are in, within are going to be slaughtered. They're going to be killed, put to the sword. The temple itself is going to be destroyed so that not one stone will be left upon another. And 40 years later, what happens? Or just about 40 years later, in 70 AD. Yeah, so I'll get you to just be a bit louder, please. Uh, Caesar's son, Titus, he goes in and destroys Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the city is destroyed. Josephus says some 1.1 million Jews were put to the sword. Now, most historians, most Bible scholars would say that Josephus in numbers has a tendency to overemphasize or to exaggerate the numbers. But they would still grant it uh, that there's still hundreds of thousands of Jews that were put to death. And guess where they were buried? 
the Valley of Blood. It was like, it was like the chief priests were, were putting money on this curse, as it were, this prophecy, as though that's what initiated this to take place and they were sealing their own fate in fulfillment of what the prophet Jeremiah spoke. So Jeremiah in tandem with Zechariah, those two aspects. So this is what's taking place. And we even see that um, Peter makes mention of it and the field is called, there's 10 bonus points. Field is called, not just the field of blood or the potter's field, but it's called in their own language, Acts chapter one, what is it? Alcadema. Akaldema, Akaldema, yeah. So in, in Acts chapter uh, one, we see that name being given to us. So, uh, Ak, A-K, or, yeah. Akaldema is the name of that field. And you see that in Acts chapter one, verse 17, maybe, uh, no, 17 is where it begins, where Peter starts referencing that, and 19, 19, 19, thank you. So Acts 1 and verse 19. Okay, so that brings us now to Pilate. So back to Matthew 27. Remember, they were taking him to Pilate. In the meantime... Judas does this, and we find out. Now, it wasn't all of these details with Judas that's being condensed into this one section. Let's look at verses 11 to 14. Now, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. And Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Mm hmm. Wow. All right, where is Jesus now? He's in front of Pilate. Where is this located? Let's have a look at our slide again. So this is the Temple Mount. On the north uh, western corner is the. You got that highlighted there? The northwestern corner. I'll just use your. Uh, yeah. Nope. Up on the other end. Other end. Yeah. That north. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Almost north to you, doesn't uh, all the, all, everything looks north when you have no, nothing to compare it to. Uh, here's something, a, a point of interest, a, a factoid for you. The temple always faces east. The tabernacle always faced east. So with the temple, it's facing toward the Kidron Valley, towards the Mount of Olives. It's facing east. So the backside of it is the western side, which is what today is referred to as the, the Western Wall. So that's this, uh, this section right here in the middle part of, of that wall is the Western Wall. Down lower, just bring it a little bit lower. Huh? Yeah, and just to the left a bit more. So just right about there is where you would see any coverage of the Western Wall on any, any coverage today. That's the section that's being referred to. So the opposite end is the northwestern corner, and that is the Praetorium, or Antonia Fortress. So let's go to the next slide. We're gonna zoom into that corner. That's, this is uh, an artist's rendition of what it may have looked like. So this is where Pilate was, had his Praetorium, his judgment room, his judgment seat, and this is where Jesus was brought. So this is still early in the morning. And I'm not sure if I've got something. Yeah, that next. I have, what do I wanna do there? Is that coming up? Uh, we'll leave that for a moment. Okay. 
So looking at 11 to 14, here they are. And I want us to look at, let's come to John chapter 18. We're looking at 28 to 38, but I don't know that we'll chew all of that off right at the moment. So what we'll do is 28 to... Let's do 28 to 32. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Remember we looked at it last week that had the Sanhedrin, the right of the sword, the Jews gladii, that they would have, by their sentencing, already carried out his death his execution, and it would have been by means of stoning. But Jesus had already spoken about his death, by what means he would die, what kind of death he would die, and it was what kind of death? Cross. cross, crucifixion. For point of reference, for your notes, and I'm not gonna write them down, but I'm gonna speak them here. First time Jesus makes mention of it is in Matthew chapter 16. Verses 21 to 23. There's some parallel passages in Mark and Luke, but we won't deal with them right now. We'll just use one. And then you, if you've got a cross-reference in your Bible, then use that to see where the others are or talk to me afterwards and I can give you where it is just for the sake of time, all right? Uh, the second time he mentions it is Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. And the third time he does, again, Matthew Chapter 20, verses 17 to 19. So he mentions, he, he prophesies his death three different times in the Synoptic Gospels. He makes reference to it in John's Gospel in chapter 3 and verse 14. He says, even as, the son of, uh, as Moses lifted the serpent on the the pole, so or in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And then it brings it into verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So that's the context of Jesus speaking there of what kind of death he would die. And then in John chapter 12, we read in verse 32, where Jesus said, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all to myself. And he's speaking about the cross. He spoke this to signify by what kind of death he would die. All right, let's... Let's look at Luke chapter 23. Way or just above here. We're looking at verses 1 to 5. The whole assembly arose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting, subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be a Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and he has come all the way here. All right, so what are the charges that he, they lay, level against Jesus before Pilate? He's leading the nation and forbidding taxes. And so who's not going to be happy about not 
getting taxes. Caesar. Caesar. And who's Caesar's representative here Pilate. in Judea? Pilate. Pilate. So, did Jesus prevent them or say, don't pay taxes to Caesar? No. Nope. What did he say? He said, give to Caesar what's due to Caesar. What belongs to God, give to God. God. Back in Luke chapter 20. All right, so 20. Uh, verse 25 is where he speaks that. The verses surrounding that is the context of it, okay? 25 is, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. Now with that in mind, we need to come... See if it, where I want to go here. So the charge is leveled. Then Pilate takes Jesus privately. John chapter 18, verses 33 to 35. Pilate then went back into the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is but now my kingdom is from another place. So what Pilate is doing here is trying to determine if Jesus is indeed treasonous. What does treason mean? Okay, yeah, so uh, betraying your country by whatever means it might be to try to overthrow uh, the government or, over, or, or assassinate a, a governmental official. So that's treason. So there, he's trying to determine if Jesus is treasonous. And then when he says, are you the king of the Jews? He's, Jesus responds, says, all right, Roman viewpoint or Jewish viewpoint? The difference here. In verse 36, he says that my kingdom is not of this world. Notice there's a one word that he uses there that is very important. He doesn't, he doesn't say my kingdom is not in this world. He says my kingdom is not of this world. So there's a big distinction. So Jesus or then, then in verse 37, Pilate's trying to figure out, are you a king in any sense of the word then? Just, so you are a king. So Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. Then he tells him, it was for this purpose that I have come into the world, uh, that I was born. And for this purpose, I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate does something that is so unfortunate. He asks a really great question. What is truth? And truth is standing before him. But he doesn't pause to receive the answer. He doesn't really care about truth. He's wondering, is it even possible to know what truth is? But he doesn't really want to know. Otherwise, he'd have taken time to say, well, what do you mean by that? Tell me more. And the world is full of people today, says, well, you have your truth and I have my truth, right? Is that possible? No. There's only one truth. And everything else bows to that truth. It's not your truth or my truth or their truth. It is the truth. And if we are in agreement and walking in line with the word of God, we, it, we're walking in truth. If we're not... We are not walking in the truth. We are deceived and deceivers. 
Praise God, we are walking according to the truth. So after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. What does he do? His first declaration of innocence. Let's come back to chapter 23 of Luke. I mentioned we're coming back and forth. We're going to wrap up with this. He stirs up the people teaching throughout. This is verse 5. We already read it. He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee even to this place. And then what do we see in verse 6? When Pilate heard this, he asked whether this man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. All right, so let's have a look at the screen as we bring this in for a landing tonight. Okay, so we've got our proximity here. This is the Antonia Fortress over here on the very right-hand corner, just up at the right a little more and down a bit there. So that's the Antonia Fortress. My cursor is, oh, there we go, okay. Antonia Fortress is here. This area on this side of the wall is Caiaphas's place. See the close proximity. All right, so uh, can I see that just for a moment? Right here is Caiaphas' place in that region. Now they're going to come here. We'll see that circle. But he learns that he's from the region of Galilee and he sends him to, so this is just another uh, vantage point of that. So you can see Antonio Fortress at the northwestern corner of the Temple Mount. Then we see circled here is Herod's palace. So it's very close. I mean, it's almost next door to Caiaphas's place. This is where he sends Jesus now. Because Herod, he looks after those things in Galilee. That's up north. Do I have, what do I have here? Just one sec. Okay, let's have a look. This is a, a depiction of Herod's palace. So this is just an up close in that. And then let's have a look at the jurisdiction. So this area in orange is there we go. This area in orange is Pilate's. My mouse is not behaving. All right, uh, for those online, oh, there we go. Okay, it is behaving now. Okay, orange is Pilate's. Pink is Herod's. So we'll go to the next slide just to give a, a it's, it depicts a little bigger area for, for Pilate. And Herod has the green. So Galilee is up in this region here that Jesus is from. When he finds out he's a Galilean, Herod is down in Jerusalem for the feast. So Pilate's thinking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pawn him off to Herod. I'm gonna make him Herod's problem because I don't wanna deal with this. So he hands, hands him over to Herod. Herod listens to him. He hears what he has to say. He interviews him. Well, in the process, he finds that he's not guilty. He rules that he's not guilty. We'll look at this in more detail uh, next week when we're together. But it says that when he sent Jesus back to Pilate, it says from that point on, they became friends. So let's finish this off looking here at Verse 12, Luke 23 and verse 12. Uh, that day, Herod and Pilate became friends before they were had been enemies. So here's what had taken place. Pilate, he received his position as the procurator or the governor of Judea through a close friend, and I'm not going to 
bog you down with the names, except to know that his name was Lucius, okay? So I'm not gonna give you the full name. Lucius was a soldier and a confidant of Emperor Tiberius. Tiberius is another name of the Lake the Sea of Galilee. It's also known as the Sea of Tiberius, named after Emperor Tiberius. When he became the captain of the Imperial Bodyguard, Lucius, known as the Praetorian Guard, remember where is Jesus brought? To the Praetorium. All right, so that's just the name of, of the guard. So he's brought before, he becomes the, the captain of the bodyguard of the, pre, of, of, becomes the, excuse me, becomes the imperial bodyguard and he uses his influence to have Pilate appointed to this position in Judea. That's how he became the governor of Judea. Later, Lucius, he desired the position of, an, of the emperor and so he, Decides he's going to assassinate Tiberius. That is the definition of treason. He failed. He was discovered before he could carry it out. And Lucius, along with others that were involved in this, were executed. The Roman Senate law launched an investigation of everyone in the empire who had any connection to Lucius to root out any remaining pockets of people that might be conspirators to overthrow Tiberius. And because of Pilate's friendship with Lucius, he also was being investigated. So the last thing he needed was for news to get back to Rome that he released someone claiming to be king and therefore a competitor to Caesar. In the midst of all of this, when Pilate became governor, he brought into Jerusalem, he marched into Jerusalem banners with Caesar's likeness, his image on the banners. Well, Herod knew how that would enrage the Jews. And so he confronted Pilate and says, please remove these ensigns, these banners. Pilate refused to do so. Herod wrote a letter to the emperor, to the Senate, to request that this be looked after, and they agreed. They spoke to, or uh, sent an envoy to Pilate and said, get rid of the ensigns, we don't need any riots in Jerusalem. And as a result of that, Pilate and Herod were butting heads because they didn't respect each other's territory as far as they were concerned. Well, Jesus unifies them. Jesus uni uni unites people, doesn't he? <laughs> Like-minded people. Like-minded people. Not the desired way to be united. It's a good way to be united in a cause, but not in a cause in being against Jesus. Although here they are, this is the second time they said, I don't find anything guilty of this guy. He's innocent. Second time, innocent. We'll look at that in more detail when we come together next week and a few other details. We're gonna look at a, a guy, neat guy in, a, in the sense of what he represents in contrast to Jesus. His name is Barabbas. So we'll look at some details regarding Barabbas, some interesting parallels with Jesus.